ขอต้อนรับทุกท่านเข้าสู่ช่วงต่อไปของของงานสัมมนานะครับซึ่งเป็นช่วงปฐกถาพิเศษและผมก็จะมาทำหน้าที่แนะนำองค์ปาฐกในวันนี้นะครับ Ladies and gentlemen it is a great honor and a pleasure for me to introduce our keynote speaker for this year's symposium Professor Robert C Merton If ever there was a time to say that someone needs no introduction this would be it Uh, so instead of going through Professor Merton's remarkable CV, which, by the way, is 25 pages long, I will instead try to relate how his work is relevant to the focus of this year's symposium. The theme for this year is innovation and productivity. And we have already seen this morning that efficient resource allocation is at the heart of achieving higher productivity. A critical element in this is the financial system, because after all, the core function of the financial system is to allocate resources along three key dimensions. One is across people through the payment system. Two is across time through savings and investment instruments. And three, across different states of the world through risk management tools. Professor Merton's work has helped to revolutionize the latter, the allocation of risk. Some may say that he, along with, uh, Fisher, um, uh, with Fisher Black and Martin Scholes, helped to invent the field. But what is clear and undisputed is that the options pricing model that they propose was a giant leap forward for financial theory. And more importantly, it had a direct and wide-ranging impact on financial practice. Now, this work came out at about the same time that the Chicago Board Options Exchange, or CBOE, was established in 1973. And it was so influential that Texas Instruments made a special calculator to store the Black Merton Scholes option pricing model. And this became a must have for all traders on the CBOE trading floor. And for this work, Professor Merton was awarded the Nobel Prize in Economic Science in 1997. Now, these days, we hear a lot of uh, interest um, surrounding fintech and financial innovation in general. But if one goes through Professor Merton's biography and his achievements over the years, uh, one realizes that financial innovation is not something new. It has always been with us. Professor Merton has been doing it all his career, and it will always evolve into the future. In essence, financial innovation is finding better ways To, to allocate resource across people, across time, and across states of the world. The form of it may change, but the substance remains the same. It is therefore very fitting and a great privilege for us to have Professor Merton speak on the topic of observations on the role of financial innovation and derivative markets in economic growth and development. Professor Merton is Distinguished Professor of Finance at the MIT Sloan School of Management and Professor Emeritus at Harvard University. He is also currently resident scientist at Dimensional Fund Advisors, who helped uh, greatly in, in assisting um, in arranging this lecture. And Professor Merton is now also the first ever Nobel laureate to speak at the Bank of Time Symposium. He has kindly agreed to take some questions at the end. So if you have some, you can note them down, send it to our system, and I will go through some of them at the end. So, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in giving Professor Merton a big, a warm welcome. It's a great pleasure and a great honor to be here today, and I thank you all for coming and allowing me to have a chance to address you. Uh, the whole theme of the conference is on innovation, innovation in Thailand. Uh, the, the, what do I do? Oh, did I already? I want to say something about these slides. Do I have to put, oh. Oh my goodness. All right. Well, I'm giving you some entertainment. Let's see. 
Okay, one more. All right, now, I was looking at the wrong picture. Okay, so uh, in the issue of innovations, first I want to point out, you know, this introduction that was, this is about finance, that a well-functioning financial system is absolutely essential for growth, economic development, and financial stability. My colleague at MIT, a fellow Nobel laureate in economics, Robert Solow, 60 years ago did research that showed growth did not come from the traditional beliefs, which is population growth or frugality, high saving rates, but rather growth came principally from technology, technological innovation. That was a very important insight, and it is explained certainly through the 20th century how growth is gone. I point that out because in the labs at MIT and other places around the world, they're just doing remarkably technology being developed. But if that technology is not brought into the broad society and used, you'll never see growth from it. And the role of the financial system, among many, is precisely to provide the means of getting the resources to where that technology can be developed and implemented, and sharing those risks in a fashion that permit implementation of things that would otherwise be too risky if we didn't have a well-functioning system. So let's be clear that the financial system is essential to the economy. Now, what I want to talk about is, since we're talking about innovation, Financial innovation is what drives improvements in the financial system. And finance science, technology, and simply economic needs are what drive the implementation of financial innovation. So that's the dynamic for the process. And I wanted to show you this, or distribute this, by showing you a set of what I call timeless examples. They come from history, to begin with, I'm going to take you from the 1970s, and while I'm in the light here, I can see you out there. Don't think you're hidden. And you're a young group, so the 1970s may seem like a long time ago. But what I want to show you from there applies as much today as it did then. Then I'm going to take you to the 1980s with another story. Then the 1990s. Now, don't worry, I have a clock on me here, so it won't be all day. They won't let me. And then by going through these so-called timeless examples, which I think are relevant still today, then I want to spend the rest of my time looking to the future. But I want for this audience to frame and remind people what finance has done for society, in particular financial innovation, this field, by the way, in addition to being very important to the growth of the economy, is a great industry. Some countries, Singapore, for example, has chosen that as one of its strategic industries. It's a growth industry, it's an innovation. And by the way, here in Asia, where <laughs> GDP has been growing and will continue to grow, yeah, we'll have our fluctuations, but by and large, this is what's going to happen it's essential that virtually every country in the region is going to have to upgrade its financial system seriously to address the issue of much higher GDP and therefore the needs for financial services, both in terms of raising capital, in terms of providing efficient use of savings, retirement. All of that has to be changed. Now, you might say that's the bad news. You've got a lot of work to do. And I don't mean it isn't being done. But what's the good news? The good news is there's a remarkable set of technologies, both computer technologies, big data, you know them all, FinTech, but also finance technologies, market-proven finance technologies, so that when the countries do rebuild their financial system, the new, upgrade it, they can do it at a scale and an efficiency far greater than anything that exists today. So if I have one piece of advice before I get into my topic, or at least a suggestion to, I won't tell you what to do. I only show you things. You decide what you want to do. But if I had one piece is, 
best practice is not good enough. So if you're going to build a retirement system, sure, look at how it's been done in the rest of the world. That's helpful. But don't stop there. That's not good enough. In fact, I don't know of any country that isn't worried about its retirement system. Therefore, looking at best practice is not going to be very useful if you want to fix your retirement system. The good news, as I say, is there's a lot of market-proven technologies and computer technologies and so forth that will allow you not only to build a much better financial system than you have, but to leapfrog over the best systems out there today. So you not only build something that will work well, but you go way ahead of the pack. And that's the reward to taking the expense and time and energy to have to redo the system. So this is a growth area if you want to develop it as a technology. Now, the examples I'm going to start with, I said the 1970s. And uh, so first of all, I'm going to talk about in the United States this example, although because it, the crisis hit in the United States, it spread in varying degrees throughout the world. But you know, we talk about 2008, 9, the great financial crisis, and then people talk about the Great Depression. I don't know why they forgot the 1970s. It seems to me a pretty impressive set of crises. So let me just remind you what happened all in the 1970s. We had the fall of Bretton Woods. I remind you, we had currencies everywhere were fixed for a generation since the 1940s. So for a generation, we hadn't thought about what do we do when currencies vary. Suddenly, they were all let loose and varying. Big shock, little experience. We had the first oil crisis. We didn't know we had to number them, but we had a couple of them before the end of the decade. Oil went from 250 a barrel to $14 a barrel. Pretty big shock. What else did we have? In the United States, we had double-digit inflation. Hard to believe today. Double-digit inflation. We had not seen that since the mid-19th century in our Civil War, 100 years before. No one, no one alive, had ever dealt with that level of inflation. And of course, what went with that level of inflation? Double-digit interest rates, also not seen for over 100 years. OK, so those are pretty big shocks. We had some regulations that said banks could not pay more than 5%. How much money do you think would be in the banks if the government is paying over 10%, full faith and credit, if the banks can't pay you more than 5%? There's not a lot of money. And there wasn't. There was no housing money. Didn't matter what credit you were. But what was on top of 10% inflation? We had 9% unemployment, not quite as high as we had in 2008, 9, 10, but not that different. And so I asked those, particularly in the central bank, what policies were, were followed? Would those policies have been feasible if you also were facing 10% inflation with your 9% unemployment? Very, very tough strategy. It's called stagflation. And I would, might mention to you, I'm not a macroeconomist, but my macroeconomist friends who I respect, I asked them, 40 years later, if stagflation came back, do we know how to cure it? And at least those ones said they don't. So let's all wish stagflation doesn't come back, OK? The stock market fell 50% in real terms in 18 months, and so forth. Now, think of all those shocks, all at one time, all without experience and all with things that we really didn't know how to deal with. What was the response in the 208-209 crisis to innovation, with respect to innovation? I think it's fair to say that the answer was, we have all these shocks and things, we have gotta slow down or even stop financial innovation, it's out of control, you know, pull everything in, simplify, don't do anything, put lots of sand in the gears, and I'm not saying that was a bad policy, but what I want to point out is that's not the only reaction you will find in crisis. It happened to be the reaction in the past crisis. What was the reaction in the 1970s? The largest wave, at least that I can have measured, of financial innovation came as a direct response, not by random, in direct response. We created the first options exchange. Puts and calls are nothing more than financial insurance. They're ways of insuring financial instruments. We had futures, which is not insurance, that's hedging. 
in response to Bretton Woods, we had currency futures markets, interest rate futures markets, stocks, financial futures. What else did we have? We had electronic stock exchanges created, money market funds and so forth that come in to deal with the interest rates in response to regulatory constraints. The index fund, so sort of passive investing, which is, everybody takes as normal today, standard core, trillions and trillions of dollars, was created then. It didn't exist before that. We, had, we created our modern pension system. All the pension funds you see in the United States were created then, corporate pensions. We, had, we got rid of the monopoly on commissions, which opened the door to institutional invest, institutionalization of the financial system. We had various, we created a national mortgage market. Remember I said there was no money for mortgages? We created a base for funding residential houses in the United States, which was global. And we didn't depend on local banks to be able to fund it. And we didn't depend on a very narrow base, but instead we used the world. And one thing that my fellow citizens in the United States just take for granted is there's always been mortgage money. Sometimes higher rates, lower rates. We never have had a repeat of 1970s in order. No matter what you, your rating, you couldn't get money. Now, people take that for granted. That wasn't the way it was. So all I wanted you to see is that these major innovations that took place under the stress of this period with the unknowns all hitting at one time, uh, not only did it help address the crisis by providing the tools and means of managing and uh, transferring risk, but it paid, been paying a dividend ever since. Sometimes in crisis you have to do things that you know are not the right thing for the long run, but like the fireman who breaks the walls on a house to get people out, in a fire, you do it because you have to. But you know that after the fire's gotten out, you're gonna have a lot of repairing to do. And sometimes that happens in responses to crises with policies, no choice. These were not of that sort. The national mortgage market has been paying dividends in the United States to society for more than four decades. These derivative markets that were created under stress have been copied by every virtual, well, certainly every developed country and most others, including here in Thailand. Not adopted under stress, adopted because what? Because you decided these were useful for managing and controlling risk to improve efficiency and support economic growth and stability. So the best evidence on derivatives is that everybody in the world has adopted them. And they've been around, you know, people talk of them sometimes like this is some newfangled thing. Every central bank uses them every day. They are a core part of our financial system globally, and they permit globalization. Now, at the same time, we had the seeds drawn. I mentioned here uh, TIA Kreff, Paul Samuelson, my mentor, the great economist, uh, he was on their board, and he said, you should provide international investment in global diversification. You should provide that as a core strategy. Never been done before on a big scale. And that, as far as I know, was the first time it was institutionalized. And of course, today, you go in anywhere, and that's sort of almost automatic to be offered, even at the retail level, that you have international diversification. So all of this happened in the 1970s. Message, the message is, if you think about the benefits that have come from these innovations and what they've done for society, I think this is a very clear, big example. All right, I better move on or we won't get anywhere. So let me go on to the 1980s. Now this one's quick, but I want to point it out to you. And this is the following. If you go back to the 70s when we had these 10% interest rates, and it's not surprising that borrowers, whether it was for real estate development, businesses, mortgages. When you have t interest rates in double digits all over the place, you could go bankrupt if you borrowed short term and rates went way up. You make your plan for your building or real estate development, suddenly your cost goes up, you could go bankrupt. So it's not surprising whether it was an individual buying a house or a developer building a, a real estate project, they wanted fixed rates. They wanted that risk out of, off the table. They, that was not their business. 
that's not a risk that you need to want to take in to be a real estate developer. So they wanted from their bank fixed rates. Now what about depositors? They wanted to get their money whenever they wanted at the price that it was at. Well, the only way you could do that is to have floating rates. So the funding came from floating rates, but the revenues to the banks came from fixed rates. Well, we all know what that means. Huge mismatch of interest rates. In fact, if you measure it, the risk in banks, good banks, not fancy you know, things that were doing wrong things, or, or you fools or knaves, good banks doing what their customers or clients want and are needed. They had the biggest risk in banks was not credit risk, it was interest rate risk. And they were always periodically going, you know, essentially insolvent. The only reason they didn't go bankrupt is because the government provided forbearance in the idea and hope that they would come around. Overnight, a simple contract forever removed this risk from every bank in the world. It was called the swap. And I'm sure you all know, as, it, as the name means it, it's a contract in which, in the case of interest rates, the bank would agree to pay a fixed rate on the swap to the counterparty and receive a floating rate. So now its revenues were fixed, it paid out fix on the contract, received back floating, which matched the risk of their deposits. Overnight, that simple contract, simple to understand, not simple to do in the scale, we know there's 600 trillion notional amount of the sloshing around the earth. To do it efficiently, effectively is a big deal. But the contract itself was very simple to understand. And overnight, every bank has a choice to take no interest rate risk. Credit risk, yes, but not interest rate risk. And that's forever. We never have to deal with that problem. In fact, today, you take a big bank, and interest rates go up, you really don't know whether that's going to hurt or help them because they can change their risk exposures very efficiently and effectively. So the simple contract that we all know solved a really big embedded risk problem, not from bad behavior, but from behavior of serving clients of the banks. So I wanted to point that out for the 1980s. And by the way, the left side is what it was like for banks before they had the swap because of the mismatch. That's the amount of variation you would have in it, very big. Once you have a swap, you can get essentially all of it. So very big difference in risk control. Now let me move on. Now I'm gonna move from that to Europe, 1990s. We're making progress, don't worry, I'm looking at the clock, okay? Germany reunified in the 90s. East Germany and West Germany. West Germany was an economic powerhouse. East Germany was not. <laughs> in fact, it was a command and control economy. Markets were not something that was used. There were no real financial markets or anything else. When they merged, it became a national objective to bring East Germany up so they were closer to be on a par with the West. That meant East Germany had to grow. I'm taking a particular example of the city of Leipzig that you can see on this map, which happened to be in the East. To grow, it had to expand the amount of electricity it had. The way it generated electricity was with natural gas. And remember, Leipzig's city managers, which, who didn't change with this, I mean, these were the people who knew their city, were not very sophisticated financially because they never had to make any financial decisions. Keep that in mind when I tell you this story. These were not sophisticated people. They were maybe smart people, but they weren't sophisticated. They were offered two opportunities, two ways to get their gas. They could take their gas from the west, from the North Sea, build a pipeline of this size for 50 million. Please, 50 million may not look big today, 300 million may not look big today. This is 25 years ago. For a city in East Germany, these are big numbers, okay? Anyway, so their choice was bring the gas from the west, pay market prices, and you have to build a $50 million pipeline to connect it. Or the Russians put together a consortium in which they offered Leipzig fixed price for gas in Deutschmarks. This is before Euro. So fixed price, so many Deutschmarks per MCF of gas for 15 years. Fixed. So one is going to be market prices. You all have a sense of how market prices of natural gas can fluctuate. Okay. The other was fixed 15 years. 
Oh, to bring it from the east, though, you had to build a much bigger pipeline, $300 million. Those were the choices. Now, the city managers thought about this, and if you'll forgive me, they felt a little bit like someone saying to you, which would you rather do, burn to death or freeze to death? I think I would say is their third choice. <laughs> because on the floating side, the taking it from the west, they're going to have prices fluctuating like this in an economy in a place where they had fixed prices for a generation. That wasn't going to work politically. On the other hand, if they took the fixed price from the Russians, they had all kinds of political risk. The first political risk, anyone who's been an official understands this, what if they're paying X Deutsche Marks for MCF under the contract? Because remember, this is a fixed contract. You have to pay it. And what if the gas trading is half X in the market? How do you explain to the citizens of Leipzig why they're paying twice the price of the market price? That's the problem of explaining hedging to millions of people in a soundbite. It's hard enough to explain to educated finance people. So they were running the political risk that if the prices didn't rise or they fell, they would have to explain that. There was another political risk, which I won't belabor, but they would then be beholden to Russia. And in particular, they'd be you know, they're depending on Russia fulfilling its obligations and also not the potential for political leverage when they control the gas flowing there. That's a fact, and we've seen subsequent years. It's not completely unfounded. So what happened? A bank, who, a big bank, who had a group who were in the solutions business, technically very skilled, very experienced, and what they did is they heard about this and they said, can we come up with a third way of doing it that improves on it for the, the, the client? And I'm, without telling you how they did it, think of yourself as the city manager. They came and said, here's what we suggest you do. Take option one, take your gas from the west and pay the market price. That's what uh, we tell them. However, any time the price you pay is above the price that Russia promised you, the ex Deutschmarks. So here's X. If it's below, you pay the market price in the West. If it's above, the bank would take the difference and rebate it to you. So do you understand what you get? You either take the market price in the West when it's below X, and if you pay more than X, you get a rebate. So what does that mean? You get the minimum of either the market price or X. Now, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out that getting the minimum of the market price or X is a better deal than just always paying X. And you got rid of two political risks. The political risk of explaining why it is you're paying above market prices to the public and the dependency on Russia. Not bad. I won't go into how they did it, but you can see it's a simple deal. And that illustrates good financial engineering solutions. It's simple for the client, not complex. One line, easy to make the decision. Now, we all know in finance the golden rule, at least the one I would teach to children from kindergarten to the end of high school, there's no free lunch, and if it's too good to be true, it's probably not true. So why did this bank, which is clearly a profit-making institution, how is it able to give so much better deal to Leipzig than the Russians, for the Russians highballing it? First of all, I've mentioned this bank, well, I can say what it is, it's been 25 years. It's the old JP Morgan. It was AAA. It was a better credit than Russia, so it wasn't a credit play at all. In fact, they got improved credit. So how is it possible to give this better deal to Leipzig? The answer is, if you do the Russians, you had to build a $300 million pipeline. Russia was not doing that out of altruism. It had to get cover, recover the cost of that pipeline. So embedded in that price was the recovery cost of that pipeline. Just as embedded in the option one in the cost was the price of the $50 million pipeline. Somebody got to pay for it. But by getting the cheaper pipeline, you save $250 million, right? 
Now you've got something to split. And it roughly turned out that the bank got $125 million, not profit, because they took all the risks and the costs, and, but they got $125 million, and Leipzig got $125 million. So what's the story here? Well, the main story is the city of Leipzig got a better deal, saved $125 million that it could use for other good things. The bank did fine. It was very complex to solve it. There were very few markets for them to lay off their risk. They had to be very creative and very knowledgeable. But that's okay. Complexity for a bank that specializes, that is where complexity belongs, not with the customer. That's what they do for a living. Just like people who design airliners, it's very complex. Well, that's what they do. But there's a part to this story that's very 2017. Because what else happened as a result of this? Purely financial transaction. The bank did nothing physical. It was just reorganizing, restructuring where the risks were born through markets through their own balance sheet. Okay? What else happened? A dirty, to the, to the environment, big, long $300 million pipeline wasn't built. Instead, a much smaller one. That's green. And that's very 2017. So this is an example from finance 25 years ago, which not only saved money and efficiency, but also made the place greener. I thought that's kind of cool. Okay, now you might think, hey, he found one example out of three decades. Well, I won't lay it because, by the way, these slides were not meant for you to read. They were meant for you to take home. If anything I say this afternoon interests you, you now have a copy of it. They're terrible slides if you had to actually look at them. Okay, so let me move on and say the following thing quickly. That another example which you can look at, in the United States, the Tennessee Valley Authority, which at one time represented one-sixth of the electricity generated in the United States, still about three and a half percent, was able to reorganize through contracts the resources of getting electricity as it goes forward in the 21st century and it reorganized them using puts and calls and so forth and so on in such a way they didn't have to build two nuclear power plants. That's the equivalent of 35 conventional power plants. So two nuclear power plants weren't built, but they got the capacity they wanted. How? By reorganizing all the resources of electricity generation through markets and instruments, just as the bank had done. Those are real effects. This idea that there's a financial sector and the real sector and there's a dichotomy only exists in out-of-date macro books. They don't exist in the real world. So enough on that. Now, let me move forward to the future. And what I want to do is take some examples now. And the list here, what can go for it. The first one, it's about policy. I thought if I'm speaking at a central bank conference, now I know this may not be your bailiwick precisely, but it is government choice, which is the issue of, and this is, of course, China in the last few years, the issue is, for stability, financial stability, there may be a belief that you have to introduce some kind of capital control. I'm not going to talk about whether that's a good idea or a bad idea. That's for you to decide. But that's the reasoning for stability. There are other reasons, governance and so forth. All right? Now, what I want to show you, though, is like many things we do, even if that's the right policy, it has a cost. And one cost I want to show you of capital controls that applies everywhere is, let's think you had complete capital controls, and then you can do partial. Complete capital controls, what does that mean? That means all the investment in the country has to be done domestically. And that domestic holders cannot invest outside. That's an extreme, but just to make it simple to see the effect, okay? Agreed? That's what capital controls mean, they were complete. Well, how can you measure that cost? Well, one cost is loss of diversification. Why? Because today, you can invest globally. I can. You as individual can, and of course institutions can, unless they're constrained from doing so. And what it turns out is that the best diversified portfolio you can have and diversification is one of the three ways of controlling risk, is to hold the world portfolio roughly in proportions to the amount outstanding that, that's been shown. 
Okay? Makes sense. Until we go to Venus or Mars, that's the best we can do. Okay? So what I did here, these numbers are from 1993 to 2015. Don't use the numbers to trade on or anything, just to illustrate the point. You can go and do your own studies, different periods. What I did is say, what happened if you just held something like a world portfolio? Very different. I'm not using the best one, I'm just using A1. So you understand, this is not a recommendation of a particular product or anything. And what I said is, my sister, who's brilliant, she's the smartest one in my family. She's a law professor and a law practitioner, and you really don't want her on the other side. But she's smart enough to know she doesn't know anything about finance. So my sister takes risks. She just holds a big, diversified world portfolio. She doesn't try to pick anything. So when I refer to that portfolio, that's my sister's portfolio who knows nothing about finance. OK? Now, if you only invested in China, what would be the menu of risk returns? The menu of my sister's choices, as you all know, that's what my sister's risk portfolio did. And you can have any, any combination of that with the risk-free asset you want. And that's the picture of risk versus return. This is the menu you can get with my sister's portfolio of risk and return, that line. This is good, that's bad, <laughs> okay? Now, if you only invest in China, if you looked at what actually happened to you, it's this blue line. Do you see that for every level of risk after the fact, for the same risk, you much, did much better with my sister's portfolio than China, despite the fact that China is a big country, highly diversified, and a growth country during this period, okay? Or for the same return, you know, you, you pick the return, you could take this risk versus that risk. You all see the red line's better, no matter what your tastes are. But it's not fair to compare the after the fact on China, because nobody knew when they invested what China was going to do. Maybe China would have done very well. It could have had bad luck. So how can we make a comparison that's like an ex-ante comparison of what the real cost of only investing in China is? I have no idea what the expected return on my sister's portfolio was back in 1993. I wouldn't try to guess that. But I can ask you the following question. Conditional on what happened to my sister's portfolio, the world, what would be your forecast of what happened to China if China neither underperformed or overperformed? That experiment. If China behaved as expected, conditional on what happened to the world, what would you predict China would have done? For jargon purposes, you would say China, China had a ex ante zero alpha. It, you use beta and alpha, if you don't know what that means, it's a way of forecasting how a piece would do relative to the whole market. There's a theory behind it. So the way you could get an estimate of that is to take the systematic risk of the beta of China, apply it to the excess return on the world, add the risk-free rate, and that's your forecast for China, what China would be expected to do if it neither underperformed or overperformed. You understand the experiment? That picture is this green line. That's what we would have expected China did if China neither under or overperformed. We can see from the picture it happened to underperform. In the jargon, it had a negative alpha. Not because it did anything wrong necessarily, just they had bad luck, but that's how it came out. This is worth comparison, and this is the cost of giving up diversification. For any risk level, you only get this reward versus this reward. That is a true cost. And I think you can see from the picture, it's not small. You have to scale where it is, but rough number, about 300 basis, 3% 3 a year is the cost. To put that in context, at 3%, your money doubles every 24 years. That's one short generation. So that means twice as much money in your pension fund versus not. That's a big number for any country, okay? So it's a big number. That doesn't mean you shouldn't do it. It just means it's a big number, not a small number, OK? And so that's how I think you can get across to people to understand one of the costs, which the capital control people didn't want to have. They didn't want to make it worse for their country's opportunities. But it was like a side effect from a medicine. If you do capital controls, then you're going to have this effect. You can't have both, or so it seems. You know, we bring finance in. Can finance do something to help this? The answer is, 
Yes. Very quickly, what it can do is go back to the swap. If there's capital controls, all the, the institutions in China have to hold all the China A shares. They can't, nobody else can if there's complete capital controls. We agree. But what if CIC, NCSF, all the institutions hold the China shares and then enter into a total return swap with Norges Bank of Norway, GIC of Singapore, Bank of Thailand maybe, or your pension funds here, with another institution outside China, in which in this swap, China pays the total return on China stock market and receives back the total return on the world portfolio, my sister's portfolio. You understand the contract? It's like the interest rate contract, but you're swapping two returns. It doesn't cost anything. I mean, not you do it for free. It's a simple exchange of risks. Now, what do the Chinese institutions get with the swap? They earn the return on the China A shares. They pay that return and receive world. So economically, they receive a diversified, they receive my sister's portfolio. So do you see we've got rid of the cost of diversification? Question is, have we somehow undercut the capital controls? Have we got around them? Have we gone against public policy? Well, let's think about it. If the capital controls people say, we have to have stability, we don't want any of these derivatives, it's a way of getting around because we can see they're getting diversification, so they must be somehow undercutting the capital controls. Well, let's do the analysis instead of knee-jerk reaction. If you don't do anything, then whatever happens, you, it's going to be whatever happens with capital controls, the green line. But what happens here? First of all, no cash flows when you do the swap. So there's no, no violation of capital controls. No, no cash flow out. Now, it's true when you settle the swap, there will be cash flows, but only for the difference of returns, not the principal amount. Nobody can pull principal amount because there's no principal amount to pull. So you don't have hundreds of billions of dollars being pulled out by foreign investors at the wrong time in China, for example, or people in China trying to get their money out because there's no place to go with it. There is no money in the first place. It's just an exchange of risk. But let's look at the payments of the risk. When does money go out of China with the swap? It goes out only when China's stock market outperforms the world stock market. Right? Because they're paying China and receiving world. So the only time the Chinese institution or individuals pay is when China has outperformed. Is that a time when you're worried about capital controls in China? When China's stock market is outperforming the world? I don't think so. It could happen, but it's pretty rare. Is that a time when you, everybody's trying to, to get out the door when China's stock market is outperforming? I don't think so. But what about in times when China underperforms, as it did in this period, the blue line? Actually, money flows in, doesn't it? Because they pay China, but they get back world, which is bigger. Actually, money flows in from this contract. Do you see that that's more stabilizing than just having the capital controls? Because money flows out when times are good and you don't care. But money flows in, which it wouldn't have flowed in, in bad times. That's my quick story. What does this say? I have no opinion on capital controls that I would say publicly anyway. Well, I'm sure everybody can agree that if we can eliminate the side effect of lost costs from diversification, who would be against that? We're, we're still doing the stability. We're not undercutting the policy, but we're getting rid of a bad side effect. I like those things, because those are things you can probably get people to agree on. Now, who would be big enough to do this in big size with China. Who? You have to get Goldman Sachs or somebody to please buy our swaps? No. There's an adding up condition. If China has too much China, the rest of the world has too little because it adds up to the world. That's the world portfolio, my sister's portfolio. So if China's selling the risk, the rest of the world wants to buy it. Norges Bank buys it, GIC wants it, Thai pension funds want it. Why? Because it's diversification for both parties. It's not an information trade. It's not guessing who's going to grow better. It's pure risk sharing. That's one of the great powers of globalization. Everybody can get the benefits of risk sharing. 
because this is not about information. Both parties want it. You could do this, you put 40 people in a room, the 40 heads of sovereign wealth funds or the bank if it's doing it or your big pension funds, and you just agree. You also need this all the time. Just do the swaps together. You can hire someone to come in, they'll do the contract for you and then you're done. Okay, everybody? So that's a real time right now, big issue. And I think you can get the principles. I won't go through all the other benefits that are in the handout of using the swaps in terms of a bunch of stuff, credit risk and all that. But you can do this tomorrow. There's not one new piece of legislation needed, not one new contract. Swaps have been used for decades. We don't have to worry about whether they're enforceable and all that stuff. There's no nothing new here, just a new application. And this can be done in enormous size. Even a professor could put those that together. And I'm just a teacher. Okay. So, and it has some other benefits. All right, let's move on because I'm running out of time. This is the list I'm not going to go through, but you can read. Same kind of picture, but let's look at Thailand. Not because you have capital control, but in general. What happens if you constrain yourself only to investing in one country, your own, for example? Not because you have to, you just choose to. Or your institutions don't do it. Your institutions only hold Thai investments. Okay? What happens? Here's my sister. Here's what Thailand did, just Thailand alone. And here's what we expected Thailand to do, given what happened to my sister's portfolio. Exactly the same as China. You see, Thailand had it somewhat underperformance in this period. Don't take it seriously. It's just randomness. You know, so you had a slightly negative alpha, minus 74 basis point alpha. Okay? But you do see the benefits if you were to use diversification versus just holding Thailand, even if it performed as expected. Another picture, same kind, for Singapore, a neighbor. Not a, a pretty good country, right? Pretty well run. All right, what do we find? There's my sister. Singapore slightly underperformed what we expected, the green line. But the big story is between the red and the green, Singapore would be much better off if it didn't just invest in Singapore, which, by the way, it doesn't do because it, okay? Does everybody see the benefit? And it's very real. It's big and it's scalable. All right. Now, what about a country that performed better than expected? How about Malaysia? Malaysia had an alpha, that's the vernacular, of 100 basis points for 22 years. So Malaysia, the blue line, actually outperformed what we expected it to do. But you notice, even though it outperformed, it had a positive alpha of 100 basis, 1%, it way underperformed still my sister for the same risk. And she knows nothing. Well, let's just one more. Now, what if I told you I know a country in Asia that for the next 22 years is going to earn a 4% alpha? That's 4% a year outperformance. Anybody in the investment industry for a scalable investment for 22 years would be so salivating. Anyone in the room that manages money would be lined up, would love to get that, for sure, right? Dream, scalable, it's a whole country. I'm sure the trustees, if you went to them and said, we have a guarantee that this country will outperform by 4% a year for the next 22 years. The temptation would be to say, well, then that's what we should invest in. This is a superior forming country, for sure. Now, you can't really get that, but imagine you were given that. What, what, how would you do? Well, here's what was expected for Indonesia. Now you know which country, the best performing for this period. Here's how it actually did. Darn good, right? 4% outperformance. But how did it do against my sister? Even with 400 basis points guaranteed outperformance, you're still underperforming my sister who knows nothing. I gave you probably one of the most investment dreams, best things you could ever imagine. You can't really get it, guaranteed. Guaranteed 4%, and you still didn't do it. I hope you get the message. Global diversification is hugely valuable to everyone. And I don't know how many ways to say this, and this has implications. So let me now talk about 
This just came out from the World Bank in July, so don't blame me for these pictures. If these numbers are wrong or they can be explained, I take no credit for them at the World Bank. But I looked at this World Bank figure, which was about what percentage of foreign investments are held in pen pension funds for various countries. Do you understand? What percentage? Yeah, it could be bonds, it could be stocks, just foreign investments. And you probably can't see it, but if you go down the list, here's Thailand. Seven tenths of one percent. That's less than one percent of the assets of the pension funds of Thailand, according to the World Bank, and maybe they're all wrong, is held in foreign assets. Remember the picture? Even if Thailand were like Indonesia for the next 20 years, Indonesia passed, you saw you're still not going to do better. Now, you can do better if you do it right. You have to mix it. You have to put diversification in. But a choice between all in one country or world is very, very tough to beat. That's what I want you to see. And I'm saying at least it's worth a discussion. Why does Thailand pension funds have essentially no foreign investment when you see these pictures. There may be an explanation. I'm not telling you to do it. I'm showing you something. I'm posing a question to be asked and thought about. You saw how big the numbers are. It's worth a discussion. All right? Now, next one, this is a different point. Asset allocation. And from the World Bank, they broke it into bonds, deposits and cash, and equities. They had other, but other is other. Now, what do we see here? These, again, are the graphs of the different amounts. Uh, now, Thailand, according to them, 62% of the assets are in bonds, 20% in deposits and cash, and 18% in, in equities. Well, I don't know how much you should have in equities. That's a risk-return thing. You know, I, uh, that's a matter of a whole bunch of things, which I certainly don't know. But the one I got to point out to you that makes absolutely no sense to me is why you have 20% of these assets in cash or deposits, short-term instruments. Now, it's not because it's so-called low risk. It's actually high risk for a pension fund. That's my point. Not, I'm not saying you should take more risk. I'm showing you that 20%, which doesn't have a high expected return, as I'll show you in a minute, that 20% is risky, very risky. Why? Because the pension fund's purpose is to provide a stream of benefits in life in the future, a standard of living of some sort. That's a stream of income, not an amount of money. Certainly, all of us understand the interest rates we've been through. A million dollars used to get 4 or 5% in the certificate of deposits in the United States 12, 13 years ago. That's 40 or 50,000 a year. Three years ago, that deposit paid 10 basis points if you were lucky. That's $1,000 per million. The income fell from 40 or 50,000 to one. How do I feel if I have to live on my income? You've preserved my million dollars. It's safe. And there's no inflation, let's even assume. But I'm getting $1,000 a year on my million, and I can't live on that. I used to get 40 or 50. You get the message? You've got to measure risk relative to what the purpose of the portfolio is. And the purpose of the portfolio is not to preserve capital. It's to provide a standard of living for retirees. You're measuring the wrong risk. And therefore, if you measure risk wrong, you can't possibly manage it right. So what do I want to show you to, to make this? This is a standard, all you investment people, this is expected return, volatility. This is for the data from 2000, uh, 2003 through 2013 or whatever, it doesn't matter. Here is treasury bills in the usual way we miss return. That's how value of the portfolio fluctuates. Low return and low risk, see, very low volatility. This is the stock market, high volatility and high average return. This thing called annuity is like a bond portfolio that locks in the income. This looks terrible. It's got huge volatility in its value because of interest rate fluctuations, and it doesn't have that higher return, right? Looks pretty crummy. But now let's measure it the right way, not in terms of fluctuation of wealth, but fluctuation in income for retirement. Not one year's income for the whole retirement. A standard of living, which is what measured by income. Now, if we absolutely immunize it, this asset has no risk in income, 
and no return. It's just a perfect match. Stocks are a different place, but you notice stocks have high volatility and high return, average return. So its characters have not changed. But look at treasury bills. Incredibly volatile and horrible returns. Why? I just explained to you where the volatility comes from. $1,000 a year versus forty dollars or $50,000 a year in income. You don't think that's a lot of volatility? Income, if it's income that matters, and that is what matters for any pension, any retirement, anywhere in the world. The one thing that people, employees can agree that they like from their employer or their government is a defined benefit pension plan that guarantees them an income in retirement. Nobody, no employees have marched that I can find in the world on their employer and say, get rid of the DB plan. That's what people want. They want a standard of living to be safe. They don't care about how much money they have. If I have a million dollars, I have no idea how I can live, as you can see. So what's the message? For the purpose of a pension, I do not understand, unless you want to speculate. You want to speculate that rates are going to go up. That's a speculation. But don't call that low risk. That's high risk. See the volatility? Thank you very much. I've run over my time. They're about, to, I can feel them. They have a little buzzer that's not buzzing me. It's shocking me saying, I'll get off the stage. But I could not leave you today without pointing this out as questions for you to think about. Not telling you what to do, although I say I can't figure out why you'd want to hold cash or deposits in, in the fund. But maybe you have ones. I'd love to hear them. Other than for speculation. And if you want to speculate that things are going to go down and so forth, that's risk taking, that's fine, but don't pretend that that's low risk. It's very high risk for the goal. Thank you all, thank you very much, and I'm done. Okay, so thank you very much for that insightful talk. It's very cool, uh, sorry I'm here, uh, to borrow your word, that you know the real tangible effects of finance um, we have a, a few questions from the from from the the the, the system. Do, does anybody have any questions physically? You can raise your hands, and uh, and uh, someone will bring a mic to you. But uh, in the meantime, there's a few questions about, as you may expect, financial regulation. So so let me try to put it together. Simply, you know, you have a lot of experience in financial innovation in practice as well as in academia. So would you have any reflections or principles to share in terms of regulating financial innovation, um, given you know, the, the fast speed that it's moving at right yes. now? Um, first of all, as I've already indicated, and it's especially so now as we're seeing FinTech, it's, we're, we're at a rate of high innovation, high need for change. So the new tools are very different. They're going to be first order effects of FinTech, and we need to change. So, we're in an environment where there should be a lot of change. So just doing what's in the past is not likely to be the right thing. So where's the role, in my view, of regulation? Well, because I believe in markets. I think most economists believe that it's very hard to not have markets if there's really no alternative. And there may be a few, but I think it's pretty well agreed. But it's also clear that markets by themselves are not sufficient because they may break down. We know that as with every part of society, professors in academia, the clergy, they're fools and knaves. They're fools and knaves professors, they're fools and knaves in clergy, and they're certainly fools and knaves in the financial world. But I mean by fools and knaves, the fools are those who are running things who didn't understand the risks of their own organization and therefore it wasn't that they were bad people in their behavior, they just didn't know what they were doing and they were out of their realm. And, you know, we can't have that. Then there were the knaves. They knew what they were doing, but they were doing it counter to the public good. They were doing things that are not acceptable and they were causing danger to us all. Can we all vote? We don't want any fools or knaves anywhere in our financial system or anywhere else running things. And we need the means of finding them and ensuring that as quickly as possible that we limit the damage they do do and get them out of there. So I think we could all agree on that. But it would be a very bad model 
to assume that that's where all the crisis has come from or will come from, bad people, stupid people. Even if you have well-informed people, well-trained people, and people who are like most people, I believe, at least the people I know in this profession, most people want to do a good job, they want to contribute, feel like they've made, sure, they like to make money, but they want to feel like they've done a good job, and I think that's actually most people. That doesn't mean there aren't bad people, we need policemen, but that's different from thinking everybody's a crook, okay? And for those people, even if everybody was that way, we would still have crises. We would still have breakdowns of markets. So we have to be prepared for that. The regulatory system's job, well, I think the first job of the regulatory system is to create trust. Trust in the financial system, in this case, among all the users, providers, consumers, and the regulator. It's a triangle. Consumer, regulator, provider. The consumer needs to trust the provider if it wants to work well. The consumer needs to trust the regulator because if they don't trust the regulator, and in some countries they don't, for the same reasons, sometimes they believe that they have a different agenda than the one that they're supposed to have, and sometimes they're felt to be in, not to be competent enough to be able to do the job they have to do. It is a very complicated world, especially with all the markets and instruments. Just like designing a very big new airplane like the Dreamliner, that can't be done on the back of an envelope by somebody with an education or the skill sets of 10 or 20 years ago, let alone 30. So we want trust there but also trust between the provider and the regulator. People sometimes forget that. For people who are in the provision business, of which I am one of them, along with being a professor, I actually do these things, design retirement systems and so forth. I want to build something that's really good that will really make people better off. One, because I think that's kind of cool. And two, I actually believe that's the best business policy. You'll make more money more stably for a longer time if you do that. Now that you can disagree with that, but I believe that, okay? If the provider and the regulator trusted each other, we could do many more things because ultimately the regulator and the provider, in my view, are on the same side of the table. The only time we're on different sides of the table is when either one or the other, the regulator or the provider, is either doing the wrong thing because they are a fool or because they're innate. The regulators are there not by definition because they should exist. They're there to make the financial system, in that case, work better for users. That's why they're there. And that's what providers are trying to do. Therefore, if they could trust each other, because the providers know an awful lot. That's what they do for a living. Remember JP Morgan solving that problem. These are highly skilled people. If you could develop a trust between the two, that's it. So, I know I'm laboring this, but this, in my view, is a very important thing. And this is not trust like apple pie. I'm talking about trust as a structural thing to improve values for everybody. And we need to recover that. And so that should be a thing. So regulation should be informed. It should understand that when you change the technology, when you change institutions, you've got to change regulations. When I design, I will tell you, I don't design starting out looking at the regulations saying, this is all I can do. What I do is the best design I know how to do, on constraint. Then at least for me, that's the best I know how to do. Now, I'm sure many others could do better. Then, if I have to implement it tomorrow, I look at the constraints, including regulatory constraints. I'm not gonna violate regulations. So then what, is, what do I do? I do the best I can subject to the constraint. But I don't quit with that because I then go and see the regulator and say, look, if this regulation is not allowing us to get to a better place, let me show you why it's a better place. We should agree if we can agree to what I'm talking about, if you believe what I'm talking about or your people test it. We should agree that this is a good idea. Change the regulation. There's no harm in changing a regulation. Just like there's no harm in changing a business plan or the institutions you use to fulfill obligations. That's what we do. So I think that's the most important thing. The most important thing is eventually you get trust. And remember, trust isn't just trustworthy. It's two things, trustworthy and competence. My grown children, I would trust with my life to make decisions for me 
when I couldn't make them myself. Maybe I shouldn't, but I do. But I wouldn't let any of my grown children near me with a scalpel to do surgery because they're not competent. So trustworthy is not enough. You need both. Trustworthy and confidence of the regulator, of the provider. If we can work towards that in that spirit, understanding that we still have to deal with the fools and knaves in every border, I think that's my best thing. Because the world is changing and it's going to change a lot more. And that's not, and I think to the good if it's done right. So I don't think we have a choice there. So I think things like functional descriptions rather than just defining everything institutionally. I just mentioned as I walk back, shadow banking. We all know what that term is, right? What is that telling you? It's telling you that thinking about things institutionally is not good enough. Because what is a shadow bank? It's just an institution that is not technically defined as a bank doing the same things that banks that are that way do. That shows you that you haven't sort of, maybe it's time to start thinking about a different approach to that. Innovation in regulation, innovation in the way we, we do things. Thank you. Um, so that's the, on the issue of trust, I think that's continue to, to the next question. Sure. You know, as trust is central to monthly economy, in fact, money is, is trust in some sense. So there's a question about cryptocurrency. I don't know if you want to answer that. I'll give you a choice. So that's one issue, cryptocurrency. Um, another one actually more relevant. Yeah. Could you comment on the role of central banks in encouraging the role of central bank? Well, central bank, say yes, government yes. in general in encouraging okay. uh, the use and awareness of hedging instruments. I give you some context in, in okay. Thailand. We've been struggling with uh, SMEs using a uh, okay. hedging. So let me try to be a little more cryptic. If I keep answering each question like I did the last one, but I feel passion. I don't have too much passion, but you can notice I have a little for the subject. Bitcoin. The first question that I think should be posed: If we were going to use Bitcoin or any version of it for a whole currency, you know, in other words, imagine we got rid of the bot and replace it with Bitcoin. I'm not saying you should, but I'm just saying if you did. The first question you need to have answered is, what happens when it fails, or if it fails? If you get the answer, it can't fail, that's when I book a plane ticket and go to another place, because that's not an answer. Everything in the world is a model, in your head, in the computer, and everything else. It's therefore incomplete. Nobody can say, this is for sure, therefore we don't have to answer that question. And by the way, I may not know why it failed. All I know is Bitcoin was going on and suddenly it shuts down or it doesn't work. I don't know why. That's crisis. What do you do in a world when that system is in the internet, meaning it's not located anywhere, no one owns it or nobody controls it, you don't know where to go for it. What function or what institution or what structure do you have? If that can't be answered, then I think that's a little bit like the retirement problem that I deal with. People say, just put your money in stocks. In the long run, for sure, they're going to, or almost for sure, they're going to earn a higher rate of return. But then, if you do that, and there's nothing wrong with it, I would always say, what do you do if it doesn't? What's your policy? If the answer is, oh no, stocks have to do that. Over 40 years, the probability is 0.99 or 97 or whatever. That's not good enough. So my main question here is not to say whether the technology works or not. And by the way, I'm not an expert in the technology for sure, but my understanding is that if I could build a fast enough machine, computer, I could front run Bitcoin. If mine's fast enough, I don't know that, but I want to know the answer to that. My point is technology is wonderful. We've been doing FinTech, I've had the good fortune for almost half a century. Computers and everything to do things that couldn't be done without them. The options market could never have operated without these things. And even if it's a Texas Instruments calculator. But the point being, that's, that's the first thing I want to see answered. And do not, I think, I mentioned it before this, there was a ship built that had its maiden voyage in 1912, 105 years ago. It was built with the greatest technology and it was described as a ship that could not sink. And it was believed enough it couldn't sink that they didn't put that many lifeboats on. The lifeboats weren't for lifeboats. They were there if you need to get in the water to paint the ship or do something or go to the land. That ship was called the Titanic. It's first time out, sadly, 
they ran into an iceberg and sunk. And a huge amount of life was lost because there weren't enough lifeboats. So I just don't believe there's anything of this sort that is foolproof enough that we don't have to have an answer of what you do. By the way, if you want to think about stocks in the long run, think of Japan. In 1990, January, the Nikkei was 39,000. 27 years later, where is it? 18,000. Where was it five or six years ago? 8,000. Second largest GDP for most of that period, third largest still, wealthy, politically stable since World War II, but its stock market is 18 and 27 years to 39. If you build a pension system on the belief that that can't happen, do you see you might have a little of a problem? I don't know how else to put it. Sorry, go ahead. That's <laughs> on that one. Oh, there was the second part of the question. Well, there was the question about currency hedging. How uh, the uh, firms don't tend to use it because they they find it costly. You know, is there a way to well to uh, nudge them to use more of that instrument? I'm very much into part of innovation. Mm -hmm. Is if something needs to be done or people want it, like hedging, and it's expensive, then you've given me an opportunity as a solution builder, as an engineer. There's something you want, and it's too costly for the use. So let's devise a way to do it. Now, I'm not going to stand up here and say I know the answers to all the questions. Everything I've showed you today, don't think of it as a ceiling. It's a floor. I'm sure if you and your teams really focused on any of the things I talked about, you'll come up with a better solution. I was just trying to show you a solution, whether it's capital controls or anything else, which were feasible, doable, in scale, tomorrow at low cost. And I believe you, if, you, if that's an important issue, we can do it. By the way, with central banks, let me suggest the following. You have open market operations. Maybe a better way to do open market operations, to improve it, not what policy you should follow, but just the operations themselves. Derivatives, this is what my Nobel work with Myron Scholes includes. Derivatives can be manufactured by dynamically trading the underlying. There's a, there's a dynamic strategy. If you don't know what I'm talking about, just think of trading. There's a trading strategy you can synthesize the payoff to a Ethereum to a derivative contract. That means you can manufacture it by trading. But you can also run it backwards. I can take a trading strategy and build a derivative that in principle exactly matches it. What does that mean for open market operation? Isn't that a dynamic strategy? Right? You've got interest rates, currency, something moves, you're going to react to it. That's a dynamic strategy. Why not? issue a derivative that matches that strategy. Does everybody get the idea? So the derivative automatically does it because of the way it's constructed. Not because of electronic trading, but because of the design of the derivative. Nothing trades, but it acts like it does. Now why might that be useful? Well, central bankers have to sleep. And sometimes markets aren't open on weekends when a crisis begins. But this contract never sleeps, and it instantly, without error, and with no transaction costs, it's pre-programmed liquidity, it'll execute the trades effectively with nothing happening. You have no trading, actually. It's also a great way to signal what your policy is, because I can look at the derivative and you're saying, now, do I say, go home, no more use for the central banker? Absolutely not. Nobody's going to build a policy that's that automatic. It's going to work. But what you can do is have your core policy out there, everybody can understand it, and if you're leaning against the wind, which is a form of insuring for the market, they'll pay you to that derivative rather than you giving it away. And it's, it has a lot of features, but my point is, I believe in every aspect of finance that you come up with, that there's innovation that can be done in finance to materially improve it, not around the edges, not as some little nice cutesy thing. Order one, I've tried to show you order one effects, like capital controls in China, 3% a year, and how you can get rid of that cost, whether or not you do capital control. Okay? So that's my message on all of that sort of thing. It sounds like central bank's job is not secured after all, it is financial innovation. Um, we have one last question. Uh, does anybody want to ask another laureate a question from the floor? This is your last chance. If not, there's one. Um, no? Okay. Oh, there's but there's one. There's someone right yes, third so, row yes, there's on the aisle. The, the mic to this. Uh, you get to ask the last question for the day. <laughs> you know, 
This that, is that like the mic's the, coming. This is like the person is on the stand being cross-examined, and they say, just one more question, uh, Professor. Here it is. Hear me? Uh, I would like to ask, uh, what do you think about the next bubble? The next? The next bubble. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, my professor, Paul Sanderson, said, was fond of saying, the stock market forecasted the last uh, 10 out of three recessions. And I think there may many times when people forecast there's a bubble, that it isn't a bubble. And there are many times, of course, when there's a bubble and nobody, well, somebody, there's always somebody who forecasted something. There's seven billion people on the planet. So, you know, there were people who forecasted Donald Trump was going to be elected president, even if he didn't think he would be, okay? But my answer is, I don't know. I think bubbles are very easy to understand after the fact, but I find that they're very remarkably difficult, even for well-meaning, highly educated people to predict beforehand. And there are people predicting them all the time, but that's my point. The fact that I predicted something, if I made 25 predictions that didn't work, and you remember the one I did because it happened and nobody else forecasted it, that's exciting, but I wouldn't trust that. My point is, I don't know how we discuss bubbles. I can understand structures of market create higher systemic risk. That may or may not be a bubble, though. But I just, I, so I, I'm, I'm going to have to plead that I, I can't answer it more than to say that I think it's extremely difficult to define beforehand, and that we need more structure than somehow assets are too high in price. Sorry, I wish I could have given you a formula. Yeah. So on that note, could you please join me in giving a big round of applause to Professor Merton for this one. Thank you. Thank you all. And as I'm, as I'm leaving, I know it's a lot easier for me to be up here talking than for you sitting there all this long time. So I want to thank you for being a wonderful audience. Thank you. Thank you.